Okay, this is uh, page B20, and uh, you'll recall we've been looking at the cell membrane. We have been describing uh, some of the roles of the proteins uh, embedded within the cell membrane. And uh, another one of the very important roles of the proteins embedded in the cell membrane is the role as receptor site proteins. Now, these receptor site proteins are located on the outer surface of the cell membrane. They are sticking out. Uh, so if we were looking here at this picture, uh, these receptor site proteins would be projecting out, sticking out on the outside surface of the cell membrane. Now, what is the purpose of the receptor site proteins? Returning back to page B23, so the receptor sites, uh, proteins we wrote, are activated by hormones, neurotransmitters, and other chemicals. Any chemical that uh, attaches and activates uh, these receptor sites is collectively known as a signal molecule or ligand. Ligand just refers to the fact that it attaches or binds uh, to the receptor site. Now these receptor site proteins are, they exhibit specificity, meaning uh, that uh, only a specific type of uh, chemical, a specific hormone, a spe specific neurotransmitter can attach and activate that particular receptor site protein. So in fact, on any given cell, there might be no receptor sites, there could be a receptor site for just one type of hormone or neurotransmitter, or there could be many different receptor sites, different receptor sites for different uh, hormones and different neurotransmitters. The receptor sites are really the answer to explain how hormones, for example, circulating in the bloodstream may affect some cells in our body, but not other cells. They can only affect those cells of our body that have a receptor site for that particular hormone. Just to clarify this, let's take a look at the next page, B24. On the top of B24, the top left, so on the top left, here it shows an endocrine cell secreting a hormone uh, into the bloodstream. Just to use as an example, let's imagine maybe that's uh, the hormone insulin being secreted by a pancreatic cell. We know it's actually the beta cells in the pancreatic islets that secrete uh, insulin. So the insulin is circulating in the bloodstream. It's flowing uh, past many cells. And here it shows a cell but even if the insulin diffuses out of the bloodstream, there are no insulin receptor sites on this particular cell, so therefore, insulin would have no effect on this cell. There would be uh, no response. On the other hand, this cell in, uh, shows that it has an insulin receptor site. The insulin, as it diffuses out of the bloodstream, can attach and activate that receptor site, creating an effect, a response. Any cell that has receptor sites for a particular hormone or neurotransmitter uh, is referred to as a target cell, a target cell, uh, a target, as it were, for that particular hormone or neurotransmitter. Now, the vast majority of receptor sites are located on the cell membrane surface. However, there are receptor sites uh, sometimes within the cell, inside the cell itself, which takes us to this picture here on the top right on page B24. So the most hormones and neurotransmitters, they are not able to get across the cell membrane. Either they are uh, hydrophilic and cannot go through that fatty cell membrane, or they're simply too large of a molecule. Insulin is simply a large protein, far too large to get across the cell membrane. So these uh, have the receptor sites on the outer surface of the cell, on the cell membrane. The exception to that is steroid hormones. So steroid hormones, and I might just parenthetically mention the hormone thyroxin, but primarily steroid hormones such as testosterone and estrogen, since steroid hormones are made from a fat, cholesterol, uh, they are fatty, they are lipophilic, and they easily can move across, uh, diffuse across that fatty cell membrane so because of that, the receptor sites are located inside the cell. Sometimes the receptor sites for the steroid hormones are in the cytoplasm. More commonly, the receptor sites are located in the nucleus of the cell, in the nucleus of the cell. Now we're going to be learning uh, very shortly that because most receptor sites for the steroid hormones are inside the nucleus, 
when the steroid hormone attaches and activates that receptor site in the nucleus, the most common effect it has is to initiate or activate transcription of a gene where a gene is transcribed, forming a messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA then travels out in the cytoplasm, uh, binds to a ribosome, and uh, that gene is then translated into the synthesis of a protein. So that's the most common way that steroid hormones, their mechanism of action. But as we said, the majority of hormones, and uh, certainly neurotransmitters, the receptor sites are on the outer cell membrane surface. The next question we might ask is, okay, so when a, a hormone or neurotransmitter attaches and activates a, a receptor site on the cell membrane surface, what happens? We indicated steroid hormones commonly initiate a, a transcription of a gene in the nucleus, but what do the protein hormones and neurotransmitters uh, do? Returning back to the previous page, B23, so we wrote that activation of the receptor site proteins on the cell membrane uh, commonly can initiate opening or closing of an ion channel or activating tr uh, transporter protein uh, in causing uh, uh, increased rate of transport by a transporter carrier protein of a chemical into a cell. Uh, thirdly, uh, the uh, uh, protein hormone or neurotransmitter may activate an enzyme that's very common and uh, fourthly, it could uh, initiate or cause a change in the shape of the cell. Uh, to help us better understand that, we're going to give you examples of each of these uh, uh, four things that could happen. Uh, so let's take a look at the next page, B24. On page B24, in the middle of the page, all right, on the middle of page B24, we're looking at a very interesting diagram. This is showing the cell membrane right here. And this is uh, the membrane receptor, or receptor site protein. And it shows a signal molecule attaching uh, to that receptor site protein. Remember, any hormone, neurotransmitter, uh, or chemical that attaches and activates a receptor site is referred to as a signal molecule or ligand, meaning that it attaches or binds and activates that receptor site. One of the more common ways that signal molecules act is after they attach to the receptor site, they commonly activate what is known as a G protein. There are many variations on this. All the textbooks go into a great deal of detail describing uh, the role of G proteins and docking proteins and uh, second messengers or intracellular messengers, uh, but we will we'll touch upon second messengers, including cyclic AMP, uh, at another time. Uh, all right, so uh, what is a G protein? Now, really, what these G proteins are is uh, they are, can be activated and they can actually move from the receptor site to another protein embedded in the cell membrane. But uh, just to kind of give us a sense of how this works and keep it very simple, so I've got my slinky here. The slinky represents a three-dimensional structure of a protein. And so we're going to simply say that this G protein uh, is uh, attached here to the uh, receptor site uh, protein. And then this G protein may be attached, or it can either move or it's attached, to either an ion channel or to an enzyme uh, or to a linker protein. In other words, it is attached to some other protein embedded in the cell membrane. So let's give you a specific example of how a G protein can lead to the opening up of an ion channel. The example that we're going to give you is that of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. This is going to be one of the most important neurotransmitters we talk about in this physiology course. So acetylcholine would, even though I've written it here, I'm going to say that that acetylcholine can attach to this receptor site and af after it attaches to the receptor site, that activates this G protein, and this G protein is connected to this sodium ion channel. And so activation of the uh, acetylcholine receptor site by acetylcholine 
activates the G protein. The G protein in turn opens up the sodium ion channel, permitting positive charged sodium ions to start to flow into the cell. We're going to be learning that that's the most common way that an action potential, an electrical current, is created within a nerve cell or a muscle cell. It is by virtue of opening up sodium ion channels, and as these positive charged sodium ions start to flow uh, into the uh, interior of the cell, that creates this electrical current called an action potential. So the first example we've given you back on page uh, B23 is we've just given you an example of how acetylcholine can activate a receptor site, an acetylcholine receptor site, leading to an opening up of an ion channel. Specifically, the example we gave was a sodium ion channel. A second example uh, we'll give, let's, uh, we'll come back to transporters, is let's look at enzyme activity. So, returning back to page B24. So, the example we're going to give now is the example of epinephrine. Now, epinephrine is also known as adrenaline. For the moment, we'll say that it's a hormone. Uh, we'll have more to say about what epinephrine's true identity is later, but most of you have heard of epinephrine or adrenaline as a hormone circulating in the bloodstream. So uh, we'll imagine a cell has an epinephrine or adrenaline receptor site. When that epinephrine or adrenaline attaches and activates that adrenaline receptor site, it again activates a G protein, and the G protein sends a signal. It is connected to an enzyme, an enzyme in the cell membrane. You might say, what do you mean? Now, wait a second, hold on, time out. What, what uh, enzyme in the uh, uh, cell membrane? Let's refer back to page B20. So back on page B20, what we're simply saying is that activation of receptor site could cause an opening up of an ion channel. And what's the link between activating the receptor site and opening up the ion channel? Commonly, a G protein. Uh, and uh, uh, here is an enzyme. So uh, in the case of epinephrine or adrenaline, when it attaches and activates this receptor site, that activates this enzyme. How does that signal get uh, sent from the receptor site, uh, the epinephrine or adrenaline receptor site to the uh, enzyme? Again, there's a G protein that uh, connects, or as it were, or transmits the signal from here to here, activating the enzyme. Uh, on our picture back on B24, on B24, the Okay, so when epinephrine attaches and activates that epinephrine or adrenaline receptor site, it in turn activates this so-called G protein. The G protein uh, sends the message to the uh, enzyme, and the enzyme obviously initiates uh, a biochemical reaction or change in the cell. Uh, the most common enzyme activated are known as protein kinases. That's actually written right here. What the protein kinase does is it activates phosphorylation uh, involving ATP, providing energy to cause a particular biochemical reaction to occur. We're not going to get into the details of the protein kinases. The main point we're trying to make is that uh, epinephrine or adrenaline was an example of when it activates a receptor site, it leads to an increased activity of an enzyme. So, uh, we've now given you an example, returning back to page B23, of how activation of receptor site can lead to a change in enzyme activity. Now, the fourth example we're going to give you is how activation of a receptor site uh, could lead to a change in the shape of a cell. Now, we've uh, mentioned linker proteins already. Let's again look on page B24. And way on the right-hand side, middle of the page, right-hand side, so it says way here on the right, alters cytoskeleton. You recall that the cytoskeleton is the arrangement of proteins in the cytoplasm that can affect the shape and even movement of a cell. Now, I've written right above uh, uh, alter cytoskeleton, I've written the words linker protein, L-I-N-K-E-R, linker protein because we know that those linker proteins are proteins that are located 
on the inside portion of the cell membrane, and they are attached to the cytoskeleton. You might say, whoa, time out, show me again. So back on page B20. So back on page B20, uh, here we had a linker protein. It is facing the cytoplasmic fluid uh, side of the cell membrane. And so what we're now going to describe is how activation of some receptor sites can in turn activate a G protein, which in turn activates the linker protein, which is attached to the cytoskeleton, which causes an initiation of change in the shape of the cell and even cellular movement. So looking again on page B24, on B24, so the specific example we're going to give you of this is we'll mention uh, the chemicals, we'll remind you of the chemicals called cytokines. Now I'm gonna write the word cytokines right here. Cytokines are chemicals that have a number of effects on cells, but these cytokine chemicals can attach and activate receptor sites, in turn activating a G protein. And while I didn't draw the slinky line all the way to here, here I drew it so as not to make a mess of our picture, but uh, uh, the uh, activation of uh, the receptor site by the cytokine chemical activates the linker protein, which in turn affects the cytoskeleton. Now, what's an example specifically of what we're talking about? The example that we've mentioned previously on page B23 is uh, chemotaxis. We've described previously how uh, chemicals released from injured cells uh, are, can be released, and they act to attract white blood cells uh, to the site of injury where a bacter bacteria or viruses or other pathogen may be located, and then these uh, white blood cells uh, can phagocytize or swallow up uh, both the uh, pathogen as well as the uh, injured cells. So that phenomenon of the white blood cells moving in the direction of uh, where those cytokine chemicals are being released is known as chemotaxis. Remember, taxis means movement, so what's causing the movement of the white blood cells are chemicals, cytokine chemicals uh, that uh, uh, are being released. And how do they work? So again, to repeat, those cytokine chemicals would attach to receptor sites on the white blood cell membrane. Uh, that in turn would lead to activation of linker proteins, uh, in turn affecting the cytoskeleton of the cell, and the cell would start to exhibit cytoplasmic streaming or movement, uh, and it would move in the direction of where those cytokines were coming from. So we have now given you uh, an example back on page uh, B23 of uh, how activation of the receptor sites by cytokines can lead to a change in the shape of the cell. The one example, the uh, uh, the one uh, other thing that can happen, which we skipped over, is how activation of the receptor site proteins could in turn lead to activation of transporter or carrier proteins. So I now want to give you an example of that. Now, that's not, that is not shown on our picture on B24, but if you look on page B24A, on page B24A, All right, so this is a picture I found in uh, Wikipedia, and I modified it so that it can de describe with greater clarity what we wanted to show you. So let's get our orientation. What we're looking at is here's the cell membrane of a cell. Uh, this is an insulin receptor site protein. And here it's showing how the hormone, the protein hormone insulin can attach and activate uh, that insulin receptor site. Now, I've drawn a G protein here, kind of looking like a slinky, and uh, it's connected or sends a signal to a transporter protein. This is labeled a glucose transporter protein. It's called that because this protein embedded in the cell membrane, when activated, can uh, cause the transport of glucose into the cell. 
Now, this does not require energy. This does not require energy to, uh, for this transporter or carrier protein to move the uh, sugars into the cell. So uh, if it required energy, it would be known as active transport. Uh, but since it doesn't require energy, uh, it is known as passive transport or facilitated diffusion. So uh, all that happens is that these sugar molecules attach to this transporter protein, and when it's activated, it will start transporting those sugars into the cell. So now we have really fleshed out the way in which insulin uh, causes the transport of sugars into a cell by facilitated diffusion or passive transport. Here it shows the sugars going into the cell, in most cells of the body, those sugars will then undergo glycolysis, the splitting of those sugars in half, in forming two pyruvate sugars. You'll recall that the process of breaking or splitting apart glucose uh, into two pyruvate sugars is called glycolysis, and that occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. However, we know that in liver cells, and muscle cells, to a lesser extent, but especially liver cells, most of the sugar that is transported into the liver cells, they are actually not broken apart for energy, uh, but uh, in cellular respiration, the sugars or glucoses are actually snapped together to form a polysaccharide called glycogen. So this is known as glycogenesis occurring in the liver cells. So whether or not you have glycogenesis as what occurs in a liver cell or uh, glycolysis, the breaking apart of sugar for, uh, uh, to make ATP, which occurs in most other cells, we now understand how uh, insulin works. It attaches and activates a recept insulin receptor site that in turn uh, sends a signal via a G protein to uh, a glucose transporter protein which starts transporting the sugars uh, into the cell. So we have now, returning back to page B23, we have now uh, described how activation of receptor site uh, protein can lead to a change in uh, enzyme activity. I do want to mention, since we've kind of uh, here just described uh, four things that can happen when uh, a receptor site is activated. I'm just going to add in here, I'm going to put in brackets uh, number five uh, to just remind us that uh, there can also lead to activation of receptor sites by steroid hormones commonly leads to uh, the transcription of a gene in the nucleus. So we'll just add that transcription of a gene in the nucleus of the cell. And of course, that specifically has to do with steroid hormones. If we consider the four effects that uh, neurotransmitters or hormones may have acting on receptor sites on the cell membrane surface and add, and add the transcription of a gene in the nucleus of a cell by a steroid hormone. So it's interesting that really there are only five major kinds of actions that a signal molecule can have uh, on a cell as far as the effects that can result. Now, of course, Activating different enzymes within the cell can lead to all kinds of different things. Take a look at now at page B25. I want to introduce another concept to you here. And on page uh, B25, what we have at the top here is here is the cell membrane. And this is a receptor site. And it shows um, let's, a signal molecule. Now, just to give us an example, use it as an example, let's consider that this is epinephrine or adrenaline. It goes by both names, and it's attaching and activating an adrenaline receptor site. As a result, it gets, we get an effect, a response. And in fact, we've learned specifically for epinephrine, it involves commonly activation of an enzyme uh, called a protein kinase. All right, now, we, they have developed drugs 
drugs that can similarly attach and activate these receptor sites. A drug that mimics the action of a particular signal molecule is known as a mimetic drug or agonist. So specifically, an example of a mimetic or agonist drug that mimics the action of epinephrine is amphetamine. Amphetamine can attach, its shape is similar to that of epinephrine, it can attach and activate that same adrenaline receptor site. Now you might say, well, why would we ever want to use this mimetic drug? Why not use uh, epinephrine? We're going to be learning that there are enzymes naturally in our body that are designed to break down our neurotransmitters and hormones fairly rapidly. In other words, if somebody were given an injection, a, a single injection of epinephrine, the effects of epinephrine in speeding up the heart rate and raising the blood pressure and increasing electrical activity in your brain would only last a matter of 10, 15 minutes or so. And then the enzymes in our body break it down very rapidly. Uh, however, because this mimetic drug is a synthetic drug, a man-made synthetic drug not naturally found in the body, uh, when it activates the receptor site, it may take that same enzyme that normally breaks epinephrine down in 10 or 15 minutes, it may take hours to break down amphetamine. The benefit of that is somebody can take a medicine, a drug, and those effects will last for hours rather than just a few minutes. Now, uh, so that's a mimetic or agonist. Now, there are also drugs known as blockers or antagonists. And what a blocker or antagonist drug does is it attaches to the re receptor site, but it doesn't activate it. It simply attaches and blocks that site. Now, an example of such a drug uh, that blocks an adrenaline receptor site are commonly known uh, by the name beta blockers, which is really short for beta adrenergic blockers. An example of such a drug is a tenolol. It goes under the brand name Tenorment. I'm not asking you to know the names of a drug, but what the beta blocker does is it attaches to the receptor site, but it doesn't activate it. So then we're thinking, why, why would we use it? What's the point? The point is, as long as that beta blocker is blocking, attached and blocking that receptor site, it prevents any epinephrine from attaching and activating that adrenaline receptor site. So then you'd say, why would you ever want to block that adrenaline receptor site? Why would you want to prevent adrenaline from working? So we'll, we're going to develop this in much greater detail later, but some people have a lot of stress in their life and they're releasing a lot of adrenaline all the time, and that's causing their heart rate to be faster than it should be, and it's increasing their blood pressure. So the doctor will tell the uh, patient who has uh, this problem, they'll say, listen, can you chill? Can you relax? I can't do that. Okay, well, if you can't chill and relax, we're going to give you this little pill. It's called a beta blocker. And that beta blocker is going to block the adrenaline receptor sites on your heart and in other places of your body. So anytime you are stressed and you're releasing all this adrenaline, <clears throat> your heart rate isn't going to speed up. Your blood pressure isn't going to increase. Why not? Because we're using this beta blocker to block those adrenaline receptor sites that uh, otherwise would be activating the heart to beat faster and cause the blood pressure to get higher. So just to summarize that point, back on page B23, back on page B23, so here I've added that we have uh, drugs that can block, they're called blockers or antagonists that block the receptor sites that temporarily stop uh, that uh, neurotransmitter or hormone or signal natural signal molecule in our body from working. Just to uh, expand one last aspect to uh, receptor sites, again on page B25. So on page B25, again using epinephrine as an example. So epinephrine, which we've just been talking about, also known as adrenaline, has an interesting effect on the blood vessels of our body. When epinephrine attaches and activates the adrenaline receptor sites, on the blood vessels of your digestive tract, your intestine, it causes the blood vessels to constrict, to get narrower, to decrease the flow of blood. But that very same epinephrine, when it attaches and activates the adrenaline receptor sites on the blood vessels in our skeletal muscle, 
The effect is that it causes those blood vessels in the skeletal muscle to get wider, to dilate, and increase the flow of blood. Well, the obvious question is, how can the same epinephrine make some blood vessels in our body get more constricted, narrow, and that same epinephrine causes other blood vessels in our body, such as in the skeletal muscle, to dilate and increase the flow of blood? The answer is that while the epinephrine or adrenaline is the same, the re adrenaline receptor sites are different. We're going to be learning that the adrenaline receptor sites that are located on the blood vessels in the digestive tract are known as alpha uh, adrenergic receptor sites, specifically alpha-1. And we're going to be learning that the adrenaline receptor sites that are located on the blood vessels of the skeletal muscle are called beta uh, adrenergic receptor sites, really beta-2. Uh, and so that, the spe specificity of the receptor site that the neurotransmitter or hormone activates really determines the specific effect or result of uh, what that neurotransmitter or hormone does.